welcome, welcome, welcome to uh, the PAVE Summit 2023. We are super excited. This, this is our fourth session. Um, I am Arlene Lemus, the CEO of PAVE Prevention. Uh, PAVE stands for Proactive Anti-Violence Education. Uh, and we are a training and consulting organization that uh, aims to reduce violence in the workplace and which will then shift the dominoes to reducing violence in the world. Uh, that's how we see ourselves. So um, we're excited about hosting our summit. This is our second summit. Uh, last year we were in person here in Chicago and we really were, our idea behind the summit is to really de-silo what's happening around violence prevention. We wanna have conversations with different sectors, with different organizations, with different people, really throw around big ideas, small ideas that are working or lessons that we've learned um, to create a safer world. Uh, that's what we're doing. We've had some incredible sessions leading up to today and I am sure today will not stop that trend. We are super excited about this conversation and our guests. Um, so we, we don't want to waste time or spend time with lengthy introductions. So we have we are putting uh, our guests, our panelists uh, bios in the chat. So please take a look at that. They are incredibly accomplished. Uh, and before I introduce them, I do want to share that we had a third panelist joining us. We were, uh, hoped to join us, uh, Carolyn Richmond. And I will share with you that she's been called away on an emergency meeting. Um, on, on with an organization where she sits on the board uh, that is dealing with the situation in Israel uh, at the moment. So she's been called away to that. Uh, if she's able to jump in at some point, she will. Um, but of course, we were uh, sad to hear that she would not join us, but uh, happy for the work uh, that she'll be doing today uh, with her board and with her organization. So um, with that in mind, let's keep her in our positive thoughts um, as we move through the session. So um, I will share with you the definition of moral imagination first, because it's something that really has been flying around in my brain since I heard it, right? And, and moral imagination is the ability to be simultaneously ethical and successful by envisioning new and creative alternatives. So let's just think about that as we move through the session today. In addition to that, I'd like us to think about why holding people accountable and holding ourselves accountable sometimes feels negative or something that we are not looking forward to. So let's just think about those two things as we move through the session today and let's get to it. Let's get our panelists uh, sharing a little bit of information and then hearing their thoughts on things. So the first person I'd like to introduce is a good friend. We've known each other for many, many years. Uh, I've known his whole entire family and I have always uh, been taken back at his commitment to service, service, serving his country, serving his community, serving his family. Um, he's a Naval grad, a cad, a Naval grad graduate, Naval Academy graduate. He's a Marine Corps, retired Marine Corps officer. He's immediately left the service and went into more service, serving on uh, school boards. Um, he is now uh, connected to the National Medal of Honor Museum and Institute, again, in service. Um, so Ty, welcome to the panel. If you could share a little bit about yourself and what you're doing, and if you see yourself in this conversation of violence prevention, and if you do, how? Well, Arlene, I, I thank you for one, for the invitation to be here. Um, always a pleasure to be in and around anything uh, in your orbit, because it's, uh, you know, uh, do good and do well. And I, I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I think you outlined, you know, most of the big rocks, the the other things that I've done and am currently doing in my day job, I'm a, um, I'm a managing director at the University of Virginia um, Darden School Foundation, and I manage the public sector portfolio for executive education programs. <clears throat> 
Um, that combined with everything that Arlene has just dis described in terms of my background, some would, you know, perhaps presuppose that I can't hold a job because I've done so many different things in my in my career. The the real the real I think perspective I bring here is I've been in so many different kinds of organizations. I've been in public and private sector. I've been in public, uh, you know, I've been in federal government. I've been in local government. I've been in nonprofits. I've been in academia. And I've um, been on as an elected official in Stafford County on both the school board and the board of supervisors. I think I have, you know, that journey has kind of led me to this point where I, I have some, some deep appreciation of what I think are core elements in allowing individuals to survive and thrive regardless of where they are in the age continuum. Um, so that that really is uh, the perspective I look forward to bringing into this conversation. Thank you, Ty. I appreciate that and, and welcome. So our next panelist, I, I was fortunate enough to uh, be at a conference where I heard him speak uh, and uh, I was able to engage in conversation after with him, and I was able to sit in earshot of conversations that he was having with others. Uh, and, and it was just incredibly, incredibly impressive. Uh, I'll share a quote, and this will just give you an idea about uh, Dr. Alonzo Kelly. Uh, he's described as the issues that Alonzo is most passionate about include education, housing, voting rights, and creating inclusive communities. Oh, just a few things, just a few things. But he, he really has exemplified to me what moral imagination looks like and what that thought process would look like if it were embodied in a person. So Dr. Alonzo Kelly, welcome. And please share a little bit about yourself. And if you do see yourself in this conversation and around violence prevention. So first, Humbled by the invitation to be here. Thank you to everyone else. Good morning, good noon, good night, wherever you are. I want to honor and respect that. Um, with your permission, I would very much like to have a conversation with people as if we've known each other for a while. I do my best work in spaces where I feel safe. And let's not make it weird. Not everybody's camera's on and I know you're in the elevator and it's creeping me out. So we're just going to pretend like we're all comfortable with each other. Um and then Cassandra turns her camera on and then eats in my face while I'm starving. It's all good though. <laughs> so uh, see, that's a family move right there. Um, this is the best way I can explain to you what it is I do. I have no idea what it is I do. <laughs> I am a, I am a mama's boy and, and mama gave me a lesson one time. I've never forgotten. Mama said an apple tree bears a fruit that for itself serves no purpose. It just makes apples and it lets people use the apples, whatever they need it for. So I have a lot of experiences and understandings of things, and I've stopped controlling what it is people do with it. This is who I am. This is what I know. This is where I've been and use it however you see fit. And uh, service is, is something I'm very passionate about. I'll tell everybody right up front, my, my whole goal is to give you a headache around this topic. So we're not going to make it weird. And the only way to do that to keep it safe is, um, as Arlene knows, I do not let people Google or use the dictionary in my space. I promise to only ask questions in a way that sets you up to be right. I'm only going to ask it like, what has your experience been or what is your understanding? And that is the only way I'm going to answer a question because then it's impossible for me to be wrong. So Arlene, I'm going to tip my hat to you to the headache I've had ever since you asked me to do this. I've been thinking for almost over a month now, what is my understanding of the difference between a moral dilemma and an ethical dilemma? And you put the word morality in this conversation. And I have been thinking about that for a month. Like, what is the difference? So there, that's me. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Thank you. Um, so I know that we are aware of the problem, right? That violence is influencing us in the workplace, in our communities, and we bring it into the workplace. But I just want to share some staggering statistics with you, okay? The International Labor Organization 
estimates that one in five globally, that's 743 million people have experienced at least one form of violence and harassment act at work during their work life. 78% of emergency department physicians and 100% of emergency department nurses have experienced violence within the last year. 90% of women and 70% of men in hospitality experience some form of sexual harassment. Studies show that 40 to 50% of athletes experiencing experience anything from mild harassment to severe abuse. And we know that elite athletes suffer at a higher rate. So those are, that's the acknowledgement of some, some of the problems, right? But we also know that according to a report in 2020, that $1,100 per employee is spent on training around safety. That's what they estimate. Each employee, right? In healthcare, $280 million are spent on preparedness and prevention and $1.1 billion a year on security and training costs. Sexual harassment training, 50, 54% of employees report that they have it at least once a year, 25% report that they have it at least twice a year, have it twice a year, every six months. So if we know the problem, if there is a lot of funding being placed, or I'm gonna say thrown at the problem, and there's no change, what do we do? What is the conversation? What, how? Somebody share with me in this moral imagination, uh, in any imagination, I'll take it to tell you the truth. What is what is it going to take, Dr. Kelly and Ty? How do we move this needle? Dr. Kelly? You're muted, my friend. I'm sorry. If Ty, I saw you beat me to the mic first. <laughs> if you wanted to go first, that's cool. All right. So um, real quick. The, I have no idea what it's going to take, but as a person who worked in healthcare, um, I have always appreciated the difference between the diagnosis and the treatment, right? Um, because it's not the same. Sometimes um, I, I've experienced people are so relieved to find out what it is that's making them sick that it's almost like finally somebody's got a name for it i know what it is it's like this weight off your shoulders and then we're all in on the treatment and just not knowing what the diagnosis is and so here's where i'd offer just for everyone's consideration i'd be looking at what is the gateway <laughs> to what creates the violence in the first place you know what i mean like there's gateway drugs right and and i would offer there is a gateway violence that leads to the other violence you referenced, and it's the psychological violence. And, yep. and I shared that if I didn't let people use a dictionary and we use this word accountable, I feel it has become the preferred professional weapon of choice, which leads to the gateway of the other violence. And by that, I mean... If I ask people what is their understanding of what it means to be accountable and I didn't let them Google it, it's not that you'd be wrong. Your answer is just incomplete. So if you look it up, it would read in a position to explain the result or the outcome. That That's all it means is if you're in a position to explain where it's been weaponized <clears throat> is I'd love if I could see everybody's show of hands or however you want to do it by show of hands. How many of you have ever received the most accountable employee award? How many of you can name somebody ever in your career that has a certificate that reads most accountable team member? Mm -hmm. Now, please do not leave me alone on this Island by show of hands or whatever you're going to do. How many of us have ever said, I wish so-and-so would be more accountable for their work. 
there'd be better results if there was more accountability on that team. So now it's a weapon. I've been holding myself accountable for over a decade working with you, and not once did you ever give me that certificate. But the one time you feel like it's missing is when you put my name and accountable in the same sentence. Now it's the gateway to me not knowing how to manage that feeling that leads to the other thing. So that's kind of what I would offer in terms of the start of the conversation, but I'd love to learn from Ty on this one. I'm going to chime in here, uh, Dr. Yeah. Joe. It reminds me of, um, you know, coming from my sports background, it's always those little things that I think coaches forget about. And what I hear when coaches have successful programs, elite programs, it's usually because they are celebrating all those little things in my sport. They're not celebrating the super kick to the head uh, that got them five <laughs> points. They're celebrating that they blocked they're celebrating that they stayed in bounds. It's all those little things uh, that contributed to the victory. Uh, and that's just when you're saying, do we ever celebrate the, the, the accountability award? That's what's brought to mind is I, I have found in watching high level coaches and people who have motivated me, it's because they get me to acknowledge those small things. Yeah, you know, it's it's important I point something out in the in the definition. It does not read the way I understand it in a position to explain the good or the bad. It simply says in a position to explain, right? So as my learning style is visual. So I live in Green Bay, Wisconsin community. I'm on the police and fire commission here. I want to give everybody a tangible example of what I'm talking about. Regardless of wherever, wherever it's happening in the world, if there is an incident between law enforcement and someone in the community in another state, in another country, in another time zone, and that video goes viral, somebody will walk up to my local law enforcement officer and go, how come you people did that to that kid? <laughs> now, is Officer Mayberry in Green Bay, Wisconsin, in a position to explain what Officer whomever was doing in Pick a City, not mine, at 2 a.m. in the morning last night? But do you see then how it feels I am holding them accountable? I have now weaponized the word. And from that exchange becomes the gateway to now the, the anxiety goes up. The relationship is fractured. There's a strain and we do that to one another and people aren't catching it. <laughs> so like I am diagnosing when accountability is being weaponized. Hmm. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Yep. Ty. I'd like to one agree with everything that you both have said so far. And I'd like to riff off that. I like the healthcare analogy. You know, are we talking about symptoms or are we talking about causes? And in preparing for this and thinking about the context for moral and the purposes of this conversation, uh, one thing struck, struck me. We can make positive changes that can do good and still be profitable. I want to focus a little bit broader and use the term return on investment to make sure that we've got application across both public and private sector in this conversation. And I'd like to... I'd like to um, kind of augment, um, Arlene, what you just put out there as far as investments and training. A couple stats I came up with, and I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to go at kindergarten through 12, you know, K through 12 level. In 2019 to 2020, we spent about $870 billion. We spent about uh, $245 billion in, in private higher education institutions in 20 and 21. 417 billion in public higher education institutions. Corporations spent over 100 billion in training in 2022. Uh, estimate for the federal government is about $1.2 billion, which is about 400 bucks per federal employee. That doesn't include state and local government, which would drive that figure a whole lot higher. Right. So training and education, that's that's long. You can do that about the numbers, bottom line. It's a big number. We put a lot into it overall. So First of all, the, the, the concept of accountability is really interesting to me because it presupposes that we understand accountable for what? 
do we have a clear definition of what that really means? And I posit the answer is no. I think that, you know, holding people accountable, you know, presupposes that we all understand accountable to what. I think there's, you know, from a Venn diagram perspective, as it comes to the standards of human interaction with each other, I think, you know, there's there's probably a high degree of Venn overlap, Venn diagram overlap about what you'd expect in any flavor organization, right? Just just standard human decency, or you know, there's there's elements that have to be common across, you know, our culture period. Um, Providing a physically and psychologically safe and secure environment really is required at all levels for the investments that we both talked about to really result in the maximum impact. And I think, you know, the root causes of environments that don't have the physical and psychologically safe and secure components, um, there's two pieces that really strike me that we kind of have to flip the script. One is the lack of organizationally defined and institutionalized definition of what those acceptable behaviors are and adequate mm -hmm. investment in the social emotional learning space to make sure that we enable and equip everybody, whatever age, wherever they are, you know, to survive and thrive in, in that organizational culture. And the second is really the individual lack of core social skills that include, you know, lack of self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills. There's some common ingredients there that we often talk about in terms of soft skills that really takes, you know, second shrift, if you will, to, um, you know, some of the functional business things, the academic core, the standards of learning, if you will. And I think those are two areas that would really help us get everybody on the same page is in, in recognizing everything that's happening about violence in the workplace, the, you know, the, the, the mental, uh, mental wellness, the physical wellness components that, that are important, making sure that we spend more time talking about those things and then the functional disciplines, the, the skills, if you will, I think would really help us, uh, you know, move, move the needle. Thank you, Ty. And, and I love the way you are suggesting that this problem needs to be met even at the elementary school level. I love that. Um, you know, we have taken on imparting these skills, these soft skills, we call them human safety skills at in the workplace because that's where we do most of our adult learning. But imagine if it was part of the onboarding process when you were 16 years old, getting your first entrance into the workforce or <clears throat> in middle school. Sorry, I'm losing my voice. But yeah, I love I love that idea that this is where these things need to be imparted. And um, there has to be an origin point, right, where we start imparting these skills earlier and on. Sooner, so, sooner rather than later, because, you know, you know, leopards don't change spots the older they get. It's more difficult to move that needle and make that change. So the sooner we can, you know, implement that focus. Interestingly, Arlene, Virginia General Assembly took some very promising steps. In 2020, the General Assembly uh, required the Virginia Department of Education to publish K through 12 social emotional learning standards. The interesting thing is they didn't mandate that any of the districts adopt them. And that's part of the, you know, which, hey, it's a good first step. And there's a lot of reasons for that, right? I mean, if you look at public education over the last 40 years, teachers now are not just there to give you reading, writing, arithmetic. They play coach, counselor, you know, confidant, you know, you know, co-opted parent, et cetera. This is, I think, and it takes resources to do these things and to do them well in, in a standardized fashion. So I'm encouraged by this as a first step. And, you know, hopefully the, the rest of the, the ju local jurisdictions can find a way to pick up that baton and implement these. It, it won't happen overnight, but you know, at least taking initial steps to make these SELs in, in, in conjunction with the SOLs, a, a standards of learning, a mandatory mm -hmm. component of what happens in public education. You know, from an institutional perspective, getting it into that particular you know segment of our demographic even before they get into the workforce. Uh, as young adults, I think is really a critical part 
uh, of making it uh, moving the needle on a national level. Hmm. Thank you, Ty. So you've 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 got my mind spinning a little bit, and through other conversations we've had at the summit, it seems to me that the trends are going to like our institutions needing to wear more hats. Um, the people who serve those institutions are needing to wear more hats. And a lot of the hats they're wearing are dealing with trauma, their own trauma and the trauma of people that come into their uh, sectors. So <clears throat> what does a trauma-informed workspace, learning space look like? And how does it become more of a norm? Um, <clears throat> here's where, here's where I'd start with that. Um, I would recommend however you do it. Cause I never tell people what to do. <laughs> um, please understand the definitions of the terms. So like, for example, I have vicarious trauma with German shepherds. That is one of the most loaded things. I could say to you right now, so I'm just going to jump to the final chapter in the book. If, if I present as a black male, I turn 50 soon. If I was raised by a little black girl born in 1928 in Philadelphia, Mississippi, what, what breed of dog, <laughs> like, like baseball rules, would it not be okay for people in my community to own? It'd be a German shepherd, right? But I've never been bitten by one. I've never owned one. I've never been chased by one. It's never sniffed around my car, right? So I inherited this thing of what happened to other people, and now I assumed it. And I think we have people in our workplaces that are bringing vicarious trauma with them, but they're being dismissed because somebody goes and never happened to you, <laughs> as, if, mm -hmm. as if it's not real, right? The, the other thing I'd offer for your consideration is, again, as a mama's boy, ma mama said, there is no good or bad except in comparison. There, there's no such thing as good until you compare it to something that's bad. <laughs> and there's no such thing as bad. In order for you to call something bad, you need something that you consider good, right? So I feel like your organizational culture is neither good nor bad. It's creating what it's creating, right? So if you put more than one generation working side by side, and I'm going to land the plane on this, I'm not going to use any words of moral judgment. Every, inher every generation inherits the truth about the world. If that is true, then can we agree that the concept of respect is evolving? Mm -hmm. it's, it's not getting better or worse. It is evolving. So in a super sensitive example, so we, we have a six-year-old son. Can we, this is my understanding that someone may have to hold me accountable for in a non-weaponized way. It is my understanding that you learn to read to the third grade and you read to learn fourth grade on. Like that's the way I understand it, right? So, so I've got this six-year-old, right? Who's learning to read. And whenever we're in the truck, it's like a big Pavlov experiment. So if he's in the back seat and he sees a word on a sign and he gets the word right, I flick him a cookie, right? So we're going down the road and he says truck and I go cookie and he says car and I say cookie and he says McDonald's and I go, dude, I don't think you really read that, but you get a cookie anyway, right? So here in Green Bay, we have somebody with a pickup truck that has it spelled out on his truck, spelled out. F your feelings. We're going to keep this family friendly. Okay. It's spelled out. When I pull up on that truck with my six-year-old, if he gets that first word, right, does he get a cookie? Of course he does. Right. Because what about luck and duck? Right. So now he gets to the first grade, the teacher's breaking all the rules down and the teacher says, we don't do that in this class because that hurts my feelings. And if my son responds, I'm going to wait for it to sink in, right? <laughs> so if he responds what that truck reads, here's my question for you. Is my son disrespectful? 
You see what I'm saying? Like he inherited that. So, so everybody, these, these kids aren't disrespectful and maybe it's just me defending kids. Cause I love kids. Don't be taking shots at kids. Take a bow because everything about them, they inherited from us. Right. Mm -hmm. But you put five generations in the same space and remove moral judgment from it. Everybody understands civil discourse, the way that they inherited it. Everybody understands civil disobedience, the way that they inherited it. Everybody understands respect the way that they inherited it. Everybody understands mental health the way that they inherited. Mm -hmm. You know what I inherited with mental health? Taking a mental health day is a luxury. That is for the privileged. Because on my worst day, I still had to go to work. <laughs> Nobody cares about me having a bad day and being at my breaking point. I still had to go to work. Now, I supervise people who want four or five 15 mental health days because they can't take enough. How do you think that goes? You, you see what I mean? So I want, I'm recommending people meet people where they are, make sure they understand these terms around trauma. I appreciate that question, Arlene. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Ty, did you want to chime in on that? Yeah, I, I, I think that's right. And I'd, I'd like to, you know, uh, augment, um, what Dr. Kelly said, you know, every, every generation and in the, every individual inherits their truth, right? And as it relates to trauma informed, to me, trauma informed equals awareness, right? I think that's part of where the understand. I mean, the spectrum of trauma is is vast, as as you know, you you described in the onset of this conversation. There's so many different dimensions to that, you know both personally, professionally, uh, at different levels and gradients of severity. And I think part of, in order to create the safe and psychologically safe environments, we need to understand what those are. We need to equip those that are in the workplace with an understanding of you know, what that looks like for different people so that they have a toolkit to effectively navigate the management in the inner relationships, whether it's management or not, that's the, that's not the right term, but to manage the relational aspects of what they need to do with, with colleagues in a in an environment, whether it's a professional or it's a school environment or whatever, understanding what those look like and what some people might be going through that unless you have that awareness and training, you're not going to be cognizant of. And you may inadvertently, you know, exhibit a behavior that triggers somebody else. So I think that's that's what that means to me is really understanding what that, you know, what that range of of uh, trauma looks like and how to equip, you know, to to at least a basic level, equip the uh, the people in that particular organizational culture with the skill sets to identify it and to effectively navigate it. Sometimes it's avoiding it, sometimes you're there and and you just have to figure out Right now that we're here and uh, you know there's been a triggering event, what do we do about it? How do we how do we gracefully and peacefully, you know, extract ourselves from whatever level of contention or confrontation exists? Hmm. So I think you know, Dr. Kelly has used the word you know how accountability and being held accountable has been weaponized. I think that acknowledging your trauma in some cases has been weaponized as well. It's it, we're not allowed to acknowledge our trauma. Um, one of the things, very impactful things that came out of our training of the macro responders in Oakland is to create a comfortableness, a trust between the two responders that are in the field to be able to say to one another, hey, when we come up on a unhoused person, it is activating for me because I was unhoused at one point in my life. Can I take the back on this event, not the front of this event? Um, but you got to be able to have that trust and, and not weaponize people's trauma. We are all dealing with trauma. Some will say cascading traumatic events are upon us <laughs> for the last several years. So Dr. Kelly, I'd love your thoughts on how do we de-weaponize acknowledging our trauma? Um, I have no idea how to do this. I'm a big fan of 
honesty and truth. So here's something honest and true. I have no idea how to teach people to extend grace. <laughs> I, I do not know how to teach that. And I feel like that's the diagnosis. Yeah. Um, I do not feel a person should be forced to reveal their trauma to me in order for me to understand why they do what they do. Mm. So what I do is by default, I work on extending grace. If a person says, hey, I need to go first, I go, okay. And now I got to figure out how to make it safe enough for you to explain that later. <laughs> but what I'm not going to do is go, why? <laughs> you know what I mean? That That's when I feel like it's, it's not okay. Um, there are a lot of things I would be very uncomfortable sharing with people in the space that's not safe. And if I'm forced to explain it first, I'm probably not coming back. You, you know what I mean? And so it's, it's gotta be a, a little bit of, of both. Um, how, how do we extend grace? I do not know how to do that, but the fact that I recognize it's what's needed is I practice on ex extending it first. I watch people automatically apply malice, which should more easily be attributed to ignorance or incompetence. And neither of those I'm using in a negative way. We are all ignorant to something. We are mm -hmm. all incompetent of something. But I watch people automatically apply malice where ignorance should be the thing, right? So doesn't want to do it because he's lazy. <laughs> no, <laughs> maybe I don't know how. Can we just start there? <laughs> right. Hmm. It reminds me of a, a, a quote that I use quite often from a friend of mine, Julie Harmon who says we need to normalize we need to normalize mistakes and have conversations around intent right yeah. uh, so i mean yeah thank you for that and i try very hard to exercise grace uh, as really as much as i can it, it it comes to the forefront of my thoughts every day almost mm -hmm. all day so thank you for the reminder on that ty what are your thoughts around that I think that's a great recipe. Won't assume positive intent. Assume that there's, it's that third information silo. You know, there's the what you know, the what you don't know, and the what you don't know, you don't know. And that's that third one that gets us all in trouble when you start making assumptions or filling in the narrative void, you know, that maps to your particular experience and isn't necessarily aligned with whatever the person you're, you're working with um, is going through. So I think, again, that's a navigational skill. Defaulting to that in terms of extending grace, I love that. I think that is absolutely, uh, that's where we we run into a lot of the issues we have at, you know, pick a level of this country right now in terms of polarization is people don't do that. And I think that gets us in trouble. So, you know, there is no cookie cutter recipe that will work without that is kind of the, the first and foremost ingredient. So I think I, you do too know how to do that. Mm. You, you really do. <laughs> that's a, that's a great, that's, that's, that's core. Everything else will flow naturally in, in, uh, seems like that, that again, that's, I think that's perfect. That's a perfect starting point for everything. Assume positive mm. intent and extend grace. Yeah, I had a I had an experience. Thank you for that, Ty. I had an experience um being introduced on stage by someone and they introduced me as this boy right here is gonna be amazing. Okay. I have to extend grace. Right? I have to. And the guy is pretty cool, right? I go on, I do my thing. Not gonna lie, he was right. I'm amazing lacking all humility right now. And then after the fact, people in the audience said, I can't believe you let him call you that. And I said, did you take into account what his lived and learned experience is? Everybody's boy, where he's from. <laughs> it's what he inherited as his language. Just like I say, sir and ma'am. You can imagine how that doesn't land very well in today's climate, right? 
by default, I say, yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. That's not landing right with some people. And what I wish they do is extend grace to me, because if we can be family for a minute, if you don't extend grace to me and you tell me I'm doing it wrong, I'm going to think you called my mama a liar and my mama raised me wrong. And now this whole thing spirals out of control. <laughs> Remember where mama is from, Mississippi. You, you see what I mean? So like mm -hmm. by default, I ask people to extend grace mm -hmm. and then check in later. <laughs> yeah. Great. Thank you. So I know personally, I've been inspired by both of you. Um, I've been inspired by the lives that you've lived. I've been inspired by the conversations we've had. So Ty, I would like you to share something that I know you're very passionate about and something that I think is going to be amazing uh, for our country, which is the opening of the National Medal of Honor Museum, which will also house an, inst uh, an institute, like a think tank, on how to use the life stories and lessons of the Medal of Honor recipients to inspire us to do better, to be more. Um, Ty. No, thank you, Arlene. I'm, I'm really pleased to be, to, to share a little insight into that. Um, so the National Medal of Honor Museum Foundation is comprised of three components. There's a monument that will go up uh, in the vicinity of the Lincoln Memorial, I think 2026. The museum is under construction in Arlington, Texas. Um, uh, that will open in March of 2025. And the Institute uh, is, a, uh, is a, a component part of that as well that I've had the privilege of uh, participating in. The, the formulation and foundation and strategy um, has three pieces. There's a center for adult learners. There's a center for K through 12. And then there's a center for thought leadership. And the whole idea of the Institute is to provide a mechanism to inspire, equip, and connect people to live the values of the Medal of Honor so that everyone can live a life of success and significance and, and really realize the full potential of our nation. And we do that by using in a, um, you know, a number of different program offerings the six core values associated with the medal itself, integrity, courage, commitment, sacrifice, citizenship, and patriotism. And, uh, and that's been, that's been an, uh, a really, really powerful journey. And, and the idea is, hey, those that are Medal of Honor recipients um, are ordinary Americans. And, you know, the, the focus and the emphasis is not on the actual uh, combat action that in and of itself to you know understand the context in which these extraordinary acts were uh, were performed is a is it's more of a backdrop. It's how do you contextualize that in the idea of or or the imagination of a you know middle schooler or a high schooler mm -hmm. or a, a young adult or or you know somebody of, of my generation and use that as a, if they, if they were able to make this tough call, you know, and, and do this in this environment, how does that apply? And how might you aspire to, you know, to, to apply that in, in your journey and, you know, where you are in your everyday life, and where you aspire to go, you know, for you or your team. So it's, it's really, you know, it's a, it's a character and values based uh, conversation and programming that we we developed um, that is is absolutely linked to everything else that we're talking about here. You know, mm -hmm. setting the conditions of you know education and training as a, a prerequisite in the safe and secure environment. You know, for for that concept in the Medal of Honor Institute to really take root, it's it also has to presuppose like everything else. Uh, in training and education and organizational behavior, that there's that physical and psychologically safe environment. So I view it as an important part of the continuum um, of this conversation. Mm. Thank you, Ty. I appreciate that. And, and I know we've had some discussions with the uh, leadership there in hopes that, uh, you know, PAVE can spark a conversation through the Institute and that think tank there about reducing violence in the workplace. So, 
I'm, I'd like to ask both of you now, uh, and you can pull in a lot of different concepts here. Actually, I hope you do, and I'm sure you will. Um, we have had conversations about the pyramid of needs, right? The things that we need to thrive and survive. Uh, and we know that safety and security is comes right after breathing and food and water. Uh, and so in order to be successful as humans, we need to feel safe. So I'd like you to speak in your realms or your experience. How is this lack of safety in many cases, whether that be from coworker to coworker, from customer to um, employee, uh, outside violence that we bring in personally, our trauma into the workplace. How is that impacting preparedness, productivity? What are your thoughts on this? Super deep question, silence, right? <laughs> um, so I, I do not claim to be nor bill myself as a violence prevention expert. So if this helps you in any way, I can tell you the point at which I enter the conversation. It's after the staff satisfaction survey <laughs> and people are telling you they're, they're not feeling well, <laughs> right? Mentally, emotionally, spiritually, psychologically, whatever it is. Um, If you, if you haven't figured it out yet, right? Like I'm a, I'm a language guy and I feel like if we, if we just ask better questions, we could get in front of this stuff sooner. Like, mm -hmm. like I'm going to give everybody a cheesy example. Okay. Super cheesy example. If you ask me if I have change for a dollar, I'm going to go on my work bag and hand you two rolls of pennies. Am I wrong? What about 95 pennies and a nickel, 90 pennies, dime, 85 pennies, three nickels, 80 pennies. Here's what's going to happen. Uh, you're either going to punch me in the face for thinking I'm being a smarty, right? You're going to walk away feeling, feeling frustrated with me that I didn't give you the help you need, or I'm biased in my opinion. You're going to ask me a better question. Hey, Alonzo, do you have change for the vending machine? Do you have change for the parking meter? Do you have four quarters? I'd like to point out to everyone, there are 293 ways to make change for a dollar. Could you imagine staying in a conversation with me for 291 options? It was all rooted in the question. I just wish we'd ask better questions. Like, I would not ask if, if I could, if I could borrow from, um, I think his name's Gary Chapman, right? The, the person who wrote five love languages, like, I know you love me because you buy me stuff, gifts. I know you love me because you tell me words of affirmation. I know you love me because you spend time with me, quality time. I know you love me. Um, let me see words, gifts, affirmation, quality time, physical touch. Cause you hold my hand, right? With all due respect, what if mine isn't on the list? <laughs> Instead of giving me five options, why don't you just ask me, Alonzo, how do I, how will I know that you feel valued? And I would say, when I feel seen, <laughs> I don't need anybody on here to buy me anything. I don't need you to spend time with me. We don't know each other yet. Please don't touch me. Physical touch is going to be awkward, but I just need to know that you see me. Right. But that's not what you ask me. You limited my options to those five. And so I feel like if I spend my all my days at home not feeling seen. And then I go to work and I'm not feeling seen. I am absolutely going to act out on people I don't care about because I still got to go back home. <laughs> and, and I just feel like if we ask better questions, it may help us a little bit. Mm. What, what I'm hearing there, Dr. Kelly, is as simple as can be. It's a communication. It's being yep. able to express <laughs> your needs. Um, you yep. know, yeah, ask better questions, communicate better. Um, one, you have to acknowledge your own needs first, but then be able yep. to express your needs as well. And this idea of feeling seen, I mean, it's a to me, it's a very simple way of... Uh, 
the current um, many current initiatives around diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. I mean, being seen. I think this is the conversation we're having. That's just a very, very. Um, we say I say this quite often. It's simple, but not easy. But, but the idea of being seen is a simple thing, you know. Um, and it's, I think it's it gonna it's perfect. gonna sound weird, right? For a second, not to interrupt. It's gonna sound weird, right? But I see Cassandra on my screen, and we've never personally met, right? So can we agree? I would have no idea what your love language is. <laughs> so the best I could do is I could say, "I see you, Cassandra." <laughs> that that's it. Sometimes people just need to know that you see them. Yeah. Gave time up, resources up to be here with us today. To know that you were seen sometimes is all it takes. So I see you. Awesome. Thank you. Ty, what are your thoughts on that? And I, I intentionally use the word preparedness because I know that this is important in the military, right? Like, and and how violence, and I'm not talking about the violence that, that our military is dealing with. I'm talking about the bullying, the harassment, the other things that have, uh, you know, have been in the in the news, right? How is this violence, uh, the full spectrum, microaggression through physical event, impacting preparedness in your opinion? It, it impacts it dramatically at all levels of any organization. And as you, you know, I spent a, a, a lot of my adult life in, in the Marine Corps, uh, in an organization with a culture that is focused on applying it. And yet, when you you read about in the news the you know what happens across DoD with all of the, the the vast amounts of sexual assault and abuse that are occurring, and you know still you know as an institution or institutions we're dealing with that, it's pretty clear that we're still working our way through trying to figure out a way to deal with that. the The severity of that, and the I guess the illumination of that in a de Department of Defense perspective is interesting. And it's also similar to, uh, and, and I can't quantitatively say whether it's it's any less impactful um, in a corporate organization or an academic organization or a nonprofit organization. My thesis is it exists everywhere. And at the end of the day, when you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, there's five rungs of that ladder, right? In safety, both personal security and frankly, psychological safety, which I think belongs in that lane as well. You know, everything else that you have to do as an individual or an organization, you know, going through love and belonging, esteem and self-actualization, look at self-actualization as a individual aspirational target. And from an organizational perspective, it's, hey, how do we really be all we can be? Well, that's a big gap to bridge in terms of really reaching our potential as individuals, organizations, or nations if you don't have that safety and security need. So my thesis is the impact is immeasurable. Um, it's difficult to get your mind around how much that is costing us, um, period. And that's not just you know limited to the United States. But I think it really is, it's a foundational layer there and I love the, you know, the light went on. I went through a, a program at Georgetown University recently uh, for facilitation. And really, you know, it was it was a three month, you know, uh, dose, if you will, uh, in, in different tranches. Light bulb really went on for me. I have focused coming from where I come from, which is mission, you know, you know, get, getting the military mission done. That really shaped a lot of me because it happened so early in my, you know, adulthood. And I carried with me many of those tenets, you know, going into the rest of my career. But, and, and I've been able to navigate, you know, and, and evolve, if you will, since then. But I, it really helped me kind of capture, if you just focus on the mission of the organization, you're missing the point. It isn't about the mission. If you don't first focus on the humans and making mm. sure that you're creating the conditions that they need to be able to show up as their best self. And what's that involved? Well, to Alonzo's point, it's, are you heard? Are you seen? Are you heard? Are you valued? Are you appreciated? You know, because if, the answer to that is no, then everything else goes downhill from there. 
if you feel fear about being able to speak your truth and and at least offer that your your perspective uh it, you know and bringing that to the table is value you're you it's it's a spot it's a downhill spiral from there you're not going to feel fulfilled you know in terms of you know be you know achieving your potential as a human being so i really i really do think it it starts there um both the physical security and if you're not physically secure you're not going to be focused on doing your best work you're going to be focused on achieving that physical and that psychological safety uh as opposed to you know doing good work um and it, it again that that's the fundamental platform like after of course you know air, water, food, shelter, so. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ty. Um, so in the past sessions, we have separated into breakout sessions at this point. I'd like to keep us all together here. Um, and if we could, if you guys are in a position to turn on those cameras, we'd really appreciate it. I know Dr. Kelly uh, especially <laughs> enjoys uh, seeing your faces. Um, so if this is possible, please do so. And we would like to open the floor. I know that if uh, I know that Dr. Kelly will always challenge us with something if we need to, but I would at fir first like to open this floor up to any questions that you may have for Ty or Dr. Kelly or both. Any questions? You can raise your hand. Cassie, the eyes, I see you moving, but I don't hear anything. Did you want to? You know, I always have something to say. Okay, please, please. <laughs> I always do. Um, so a couple things came up for me is, um, and and it's it's funny. I've and I I I kind of looked at who was all the people from the beginning who was going to be on here, but I didn't realize today. I, for somehow I missed this. And um, um, Alonzo Kelly, I've been fo following him. And he's, of course, in my neck of the woods. I'm in Appleton. So we're right there. And he's in town all the time giving presentations to our governments and stuff like that. So I think that's really cool. And for those that don't know, I when you talked about accountability, my work where I worked last in a domestic violence agency, and I worked with um, those who cause harm. Um, and one specifically is a group of the men who use violence against their partners and their families. And um, this is a quote from, um, uh, we use the Duluth method and, and Scott Miller who runs that um, up there um, quoted this and we talked this about accountability because obviously we define that with the men, talk about that with the men. And I loved this quote and it, I bring it around. Account accountability is owning what we have done, which is something external, um, understanding why we did it, which is internal, and then making amends to those who have been harmed if we can or can't, right? But the beginning part is that 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 um, owning what we've done is it's personal, it's us, and then and then understanding why, so you can make those changes, right? And understanding that the accountability is it's it's yourself. You can't make anyone accountable. That's just punishment. And so it's just it's for me that's always been a thing. But my, my comment is, and that it just keeps coming back to, the reason we have all this is most of these systems, the, the violence is inherent in this, how the systems were built, the places that we work, many of them. And so I think when you are at work and you see this other type of violence with the people that are running it, it's hard to behave like that as an employee when it's not all the way through what we work. Um, I mean, it's not in everything, but... That's, those are my thoughts on that. And there's just lots of different ways that both of them have brought up ways that we be mindful and that we ask those questions and be curious um, to try and understand first um, instead of that. But it's been a, it's, it's, this is a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Cassie. I just want to chime in before I let um, Dr. Kelly and Ty respond if they'd like to. You know, one of the things that came up with my close circle, my family and friends, when I took the helm of pay prevention, is everybody wanted to share with me when something, stories of things that had happened to them at work. Uh, and when I asked them why they didn't say anything or why I had never heard about it or why they didn't 
report at work, it really was that they felt no one was ever held accountable. So it didn't feel like they should say anything. It wouldn't be worth it. So um, I, I just want to put that out there because it's reminded when you when you presented your external, internal, and then kind of a, a resolution. I don't I don't know how we how we bring that into a more of a mainstream. Uh, and, and Dr. Kelly and Ty, if you want to respond to anything Cassandra said, and then we'll go to Mandy's question. I'll just be super short and brief. Um, our six-year-old in flag football put a move on another kid and like broke his ankles, right? So I asked him, I was like, hey, how'd you do that? And he explained it. And then our 16-year-old uh, did something super cool at school. And I go, how did you think that through? And then he explained it. And here's what I followed up with each one of them. I appreciate you holding yourself accountable for that. I am undoing this idea that the only time they're going to hear accountable is when they did something wrong. The fact that they could explain what they did, why they did it, what they thought was going to happen, and then what happened, that is accountable. So I go, I thank you for holding yourself accountable for that. Hey, how did the cup get broken? I dropped it. I spilled some water and I forgot to look. Thank you for holding yourself accountable for that. Not thank you for telling the truth. What did I expect? You were going to lie to me? No, thank you for holding yourself accountable for that. So I am doing everything I can to undo what the next generation is inheriting with these words. Thank you. I love what Alonzo just said. And, and Cassandra, I want to I want to thank you for the amazing definition of accountability and it kind of the light bulb, but it's kind of an aha moment that it is three elements. It's not just owning it, you know, but the other two, the understanding why. And this is this is, I'm sorry, Alonzo, to revert to the negative connotation, but I think, you know, in the in the context um uh, and I fully support uh, the positive uh, elements of accountability too. But as it relates to the negative ones, that's that's a really important distinction in terms of, you know, there's three pieces to truly living accountability. And I, I, I just thank you for bringing that to the fore. It, and it, it helps me understand why sometimes apologies and owning something fall short of really, you know, fully fixing up an issue that that a, that so, someone else did or perhaps why you know my own you know, you know short shortcomings in leadership positions uh why they didn't have the impact I thought they did yeah I did that my bad sorry um the rest of the explanation about and here's the why behind it and how can I make it up to you you know I think that mm -hmm. those are those those last two things are uh, often where, you know, people in leadership positions um, fall short. So thank you for bringing that up. Mandy. Hello. Okay. I have two separate questions. One uh, for Dr. Alonzo, and one for Ty. I'll start with Dr. Alonzo. So I saw like in your bio that you do coaching. And my question is like, what's like a theme when women come to you, when it comes to work, as far as what they're dealing with, what you work with them on, is there something that's pretty common throughout or in your personal experience, just with work? Um, yep. Explicit to women. Um, how about I give you the last couple? <laughs> okay. One was um, by age, a younger woman leading older men um another uh is uh this um concept of imposter syndrome especially women in in the field of finance um that's super real and um this is one just so everybody knows like i said no to this because i'm a big fan of being explicit in what it is i do i could not help managing this this pressure of work-life balance um because i'm not good at it <laughs> <laughs> i would be a horrible co-sponsor for this person on work-life balance but that was the request like how do i 
I do it. So those those are the the last three. It was uh, imposter syndrome, um, leading a group older than, and then this this kind of, yeah, and then work life balance. Got it. Thank you. Yep. And for Mr. Ty, so I grew up a military brat. My whole family was military. My question to you is like, how would I phrase this? So things that worked or you learned in the military, you know, to work with people, manage people, men and women, what transferred over to your civilian life that's like key that really works? And what are some things that you had to kind of adjust to that did it? Thanks for the question, Mandy. I, th I think the key thing for me was uh, from the very onset, it was clear it's not about me, it's about we. So the real concept of, you know, surrounding myself with people smarter than me and giving them the opportunity to uh, provide their input as we shaped whatever, you know, plan to accomplish whatever we had to accomplish. Those are those are key things that really have held me into in good stead. Uh, imperfectly, I've exported them to, you know, trying to, you know, emulate that in any organization I've been a part of, either in a leadership capacity or as an individual contributor, just recognizing the importance of, you know, leveraging the collective goodness of everybody from every background around me, um, you know, for the greater good. Um, I think that the challenges are, have been sometimes subtle and not so subtle refinements about developing a deeper understanding on an individual by individual level of what will, what conditions do I need to create to allow, you know, Joe, Mary, Larry, and Susie to share and, and show up as a, their best selves. Those are the the things that I've I I continue to work on, you know, because it you know, you you have to understand you know the diversity of you know any team or any organizational composition. So those are those are the things that I continue to work on with myself, understanding me, what makes me tick, and and using that knowledge to understand that. Not everybody is like me, thinks like me, um, has the same aspirations of me, and try to understand what uh, what I can do to create an environment where that person feels um, empowered, valued, um, heard, uh, seen uh, in in the overall um, enterprise. Thank you. Do we have any other additional questions? So I think I am going to put someone on the spot because I think this is an incredible example of using moral imagination. Uh, and I know this person has fought for this program. Um, Sheila, are you in a position where you can share with us any information about the program you are putting forward at Lurie's Children's Hospital? Sheila Hickey. Rascal, can you hear me? We can. You're a rascal. Um, <laughs> it, it, I'm sorry, is that that emotional prelude to uh, harassment um, that Dr. Kelly talked about? Um, yeah, you know, we're, uh, at, we're a pediatric hospital, right? So we've learned that we're starting a violence intervention program here at Larry Children in order to provide immediate intervention for victims of community violence. Um, given that we're a pediatric hospital, we recognize that many of our victims of community violence have been victims of violence prior to presentation to the ER. And that violence may be emotional, verbal, or physical and taking place earlier in their lives in their childhood. So our program will start intervening with children starting at the age of zero until 19 um, and helping families go towards more of a healthy lifestyle if they volunteer to participate in the program. Um, I, I certainly have enjoyed the kind of discussion about 
using um, accountability. Um, Dr. Kelly, your examples of how to use that with your children was really quite, um, I, I really enjoyed that. I've enjoyed the whole discussion. But that's kind of how we're, we're starting. And our hope is, is that the earlier we intervene um, with acts of violence, that we can stop uh, children from being re-victimized in different areas of their lives and help families be able to uh, move on towards maybe healthier lifestyles um, as defined by them. And Sheila, this is support for like six months or more than six months after they've presented in the in the hospital, correct? So it's support and counseling and things like that? Yeah, yes, yeah, we'll be following them for six months, providing them with care coordination, ongoing assessment, um, you know, even the discussion pertaining to libraries uh, at the beginning of the week was really just fabulous. And uh, I've actually gone to the Chicago Public Library website and um, I looked at what resources they have um, within the different communities that we're going to focus on here at Larry Children's. And really, they're, they're quite extensive and be able to accompany parents to participate in the programming, so partnering with them and teaming with them, and then backing off as the family gets used to um, participating in different activities. So the libraries were, yeah, a tremendous resource. Great, thank you, Sheila. So again, this is I, I'm aware of this program that Sheila has fought so um, yeah. passionately for, uh, and it is to me an example of this moral imagination. A hospital doesn't need to follow that person, uh, that child in this case, after a violent event. It is choosing, it is being creative in its approach to community health care uh, and making a better uh, community, uh, making a better city for us in Chicago. So um, I'm grateful for that. Thank you for sharing, Sheila. Are there any other questions or thoughts that we'd like to, that you would like to discuss? Dr. Can Kelly? I offer a critical thinking exercise? Because you know, please. I love those. Okay, family, here's your homework, and I'm never going to collect it. It's just for fun, right? So here's how it works. You are not allowed to use Google or use the dictionary. Here's the question. What is your understanding of the difference between empathy, sympathy, and compassion? Empathy, sympathy, and compassion. I will tell you rooted in my experience why it matters. If I present to you and you offer the wrong one, you made it worse. <laughs> That's why it matters, okay? Uh, for the visual learners in the room, I'll give you an example just to have a little fun with it. Let's say when I leave here, I hop in my truck, there's somebody on the corner who has a sign that says I'm hungry. So I've got a peanut butter and jelly sandwich in my truck. I know I'm not going to eat it. It's still good. I hand it to the person. I drive off. Which, if any, was that? <laughs> was that empathy? Sympathy? Compassion? Or none of the above? So this is where I feel like, you know, in terms of imagination, right? Set up scenarios where everybody's allowed to be right, so long as they start their answer with, here's my understanding. Mm -hmm. And then have a conversation on, so what happens if we offer someone sympathy, and that not only is not what they need, why did that make it worse? <laughs> now, in my petty voice, I'd like to offer to all of you, it is absolutely true I have bought sympathy cards on the way to funerals from the gas station. How come I can't buy an empathy card? How come I can't buy a compassion card? You gotta feel it. You see what I'm saying? So I'm just, I'm just saying like, this is where in my brain, like the words absolutely matter. The words matter. And then the second one, and then I'm done. Cause I'm not going to hijack the conversation. <laughs> my, um, uh, my dissertation for one of my doctorates is, is on this concept of the sucker's choice. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the sucker's choice. Kind of goes like this. 
the bully walks up to a kid and says, I'll take your lunch today or tomorrow. Which day do you want me to take it? And what the kid does is the kid rationalizes, well, my mom made peanut butter and jelly today. I don't even like peanut butter and jelly today. I had a big breakfast. You can have it today. I'll have my favorite lunch tomorrow. Or I really like peanut butter and jelly. So I'm going to eat this today. I'm going to have my mom make tuna tomorrow. And I'm going to give it to you because I hate tuna. It's a sucker's choice because what I'd like to believe is if I asked any of you, which day do you want me to take your lunch? You would say neither. What I feel contributes to this feeling of trauma and violence is we are presented with sucker's choices and people aren't catching it's a sucker's choice. No, you don't get to disrespect me ever. Not, you know, I can call you this at the meeting or at the company picnic. No, no, bro. How about, how about never? Um, my sucker's choice dissertation was taking a group of young black men and saying to them, I can fix education or healthcare. Which one you want me to fix? It was a, it was a quantitative study. They had amazing answers for whichever one they picked, but they didn't realize as I was just counting how many people rejected my question. So they rationalized which one to go without until one day they realized they're sick of going without, and then they lash out. That's all. Empathy, sympathy, compassion. What is your understanding of the difference? I gave someone a sandwich. Which one was that for you? Why does it matter? And then the second one is how, if at all, are we presenting suckers choices to our employees or teams or families in our workplace? And how is that contributing? There you go, Arlene. Homework done. Professor hat off. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Kelly. I, I would say that I just want to, I, I, I think this is an argument, this sucker's choice is an argument and supports what PAVE is trying to do, to be honest with you. It is to empower the individual to identify and speak up for that sucker's choice, through that sucker's yep. choice, to be those people that come forward and say, hey, I don't, I don't accept that question. I don't accept those yeah. options. Uh, to I can be punch you in the to, face or in the stomach. Yeah. I'm sorry. To be what? Able to set a boundary. <laughs> yeah. To be able to set a boundary to identify yeah. that, Hey, this conversation is not what I'd like it to be. It is inappropriate or whatever, but you know, I, I do believe I, I, hearing you present the sucker's choice. Um, I, I feel that, Employees are struggling with that every day around how they're treated and the toxic culture that they may be working within. Um, this this sucker's choice is there. And in fairness, I think leaders are too. Hmm. I can give you money in your budget to address this issue, or I can give you money in your budget to address this issue, but I can't fund both. So now leaders have been presented with a sucker's choice. And now they got to figure out which one can I do without. I can send everybody to the training or I could pay Ty to come do it for the management team. <laughs> How about we figure out well, both? How about you well, figure out well, both? <laughs> all I'm going to tell you is just remember plagiarism is the highest form of flattery. And I am writing that down and I'm going to use it and I will attribute it. So thank you. Love you, That's, bro. <laughs> how, how you characterize that? You, you're exactly right. When you get right down to it, and this is, this is, you know, it's, it's the sucker's choice that's endemic across the decision space, uh, you know, that we're talking about here and so many others. It's, it's just a perfect metaphor. Uh, and I like peanut butter and jelly and I like, you know, uh, I like the hoagie. So, you know, I'm not, I'm going to push back on the question. That's awesome. Right. Me too. But so, I do worry about the kid who masters the rationalization. Yes. 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 They figure yes. out how to go without, they start to figure out how to manipulate the bully. You know what I mean? And then at some point they can't out manipulate the buddy bully. Then what? And you're not you're not taking the bully out, so you still have the problem that you're right. trying to solve that Pave's trying to solve. Yeah, yeah. Again, you are pulling me back into empowering that individual with the skill set 
to one process what's happening, what they're being presented uh, with, and being able to make the best choice for themselves. Um, Nikki, please. I just have a question that's coming in from Heather Turnbull. Uh, in times when it seems there's little or no personal responsibility assumed about organizational leaders for their inappropriate, let alone violent behavior, how can we encourage systemic change to drive more accountability and repercussions in aid of healthier workplaces for all? Hmm. You Dr. know, it's Kelly, kind of, there's, there's a there's a circularity there that that isn't it, it it's it's daunting, right? And it all starts with illumination. I think you know if the the more vocal the more empowered individuals feel to push back on uh, and and highlight the, those kinds of behaviors, you know, the more that will surface. I mean, and, and, and you'd like to think that there's a, um, we, we do a better job of being able to fix it as a result, um, but taking that first step, um, that, that's a that's a tough one. I don't have the answer. I have one of the ingredients, which I think starts with everything that we're talking about here, is giving individuals the power uh, to to speak up and 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 let people know and make it safe for them to let people know this inappropriate stuff is happening to me, uh, and I'm not going to stand for it. Hmm. Uh, so I'd like to offer the following disclaimer. The views expressed on the show do not necessarily reflect PAVE and any of the uh, attitudes and beliefs of PAVE and staff and anything else above. This is this is Alonzo, okay? I feel positivity is the primary source of motivation is overrated. I will move faster when I understand what it is costing me not to. I do not move fast because I think it's a, a cool thing to do and I'll feel better. I'll move faster when I understand what it is costing me not to. And so whenever I find myself in a space of toxicity, what I say to myself is that didn't happen overnight and it's not costing them anything to change. <laughs> mm. I think the sooner it costs somebody or they understand what it is costing them, the faster they will move. I don't think any of us are going to move until we, we're not going to move as fast until we understand what it's costing us not to, which is why I reject all new year's resolutions. I'm not understanding what you can't do on October 12th that you need to wait till January 1st to do. It's clearly not costing you enough. So then it's a cutesy thing and I'm not betting on you. <laughs> but Pave didn't say that Alonzo did. Don't be mad at Arlene. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Okay, so I wanted to share, there's another uh, comment uh, in, the, in the chat from Krista. In my experience, uh, HR departments also do not hold predators accountable for harassment, et cetera. They protect the company first and only. Maybe solutions include redefining the role of HR departments. Uh, I thank you for this comment, Krista. I also believe that there has been a shift in HR to protect the company rather than the clients. Originally, I think its intention was to protect the clients, to protect the employees, you know, um, but I think it has shifted. And maybe Tracy wants to talk to this point, being an HR professional as well. But Dr. Alonzo, I know you have a uh, an HR background. Did you want to chime on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll say this. One of the best and most unfair and best interview questions I ever got for an <laughs> HR role, I was asked, Am I pro-employer or pro-employee? You you do hear like the very epitome of a sucker's choice question, right? <laughs> Big time. So here's what I said. I'm pro-patient. <laughs> I, I reject that question. I do think people want to know where you are and loyalties lie, and I'm not going to deny human behavior, but I also think it's a sucker's choice question and explicit to Nikki's comment, I would say maybe it's not costing you enough <laughs> to hold the perpetrator accountable. 
And so one perpetrator cost you enough that you look at it different. That's what I would say. Not you specifically, but in general. I sure agree with that. And I also agree with Nikki's observation in, in organizations in the last decade that I've been a part of for whatever reason, HR seems to be protecting, you know, their mantra is protecting the best interests of the organization. What, what is really perplexing to me, and that is an ultimate sucker's choice, is if you don't get as an HR professional that protecting the organization includes, first and foremost, protecting the employees. And it's not just protecting. I mean, you you have to ha you have to be objective because sometimes employees do things that do, you know, cause you know peril for the organization. So you have to have a bit of a balanced approach, but you can't be neutral in 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 situations where you know, they're, they're being wronged. They have to have an advocate. And somehow I think that's, that part of the HR role seems to be getting lost uh, in many cultures, uh, organizational cultures today. I mm. think there's, there's a lot of danger in that. I think that's a great way to put it, Ty, um, that, you know, if you were asked that question, are you pro-employee or pro-employer? Well, in order for me to be pro-employer, I have to be pro-employee. I love that. I love that. Tracy, did you want to chime in at all? Um, <clears throat> my re my reception's not excellent, so if it cuts out, I apologize. I would just say, um, I saw your comment, Kristen. It, it always makes me sad because I don't think that, I, I agree that lots of HR works that way. I've always been like, I am here for the people and the people make the organization. And I do represent the the organization, but I'm here for the people. And so, and that's, that's kind of what I live by. And so it is, I've been asked that, are you, you know, are you, are you here for the, org are you pro employer or pro, pro employee? And I'm like, eh, no, it's not how I see my role. So I think it's, I just, it takes a while. I think when I've been um, at organizations, people are like, oh, I didn't know HR I could go to for questions. I didn't know you could be HR could be kind or helpful. And I'm like, what kind of HR have you encountered? And it makes me sad. And so I just try to, in my work, be there for the people and advocate, you know, advocate for the mission of the organization, but I'm there for the people um, and the people make up the organization. And so the best that we can do to support the people, whether they're there at the organization doing amazing things or they leave or we have to ask them to leave or whatever the circumstance, we're there for the people and um, I want to help them thrive and whatever that may be. So... Um, I just hope that there can be work. I always hope that people are in HR because they care about the people and they like people, but I don't know if that's always the reason people go into HR. But Well, before I close up this session, because we are, we have hit, uh, these sessions have gone so quickly for me. Um, so I, I, I I hope it's, I hope you're feeling the same way that, wow, there's so much going on in here. What, we're at 90 minutes already? What the heck? Um, but I would uh, uh, like to allow our panelists, uh, if there are any well, parting thoughts you'd like to share with us, um, Ty? No parting thoughts, just have really enjoyed and appreciated the conversation and, and being part of this discussion. I think it's it's really um, a, a seminal issue that we, 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 need to, we need to apply additional focus and attention to and resources to resolve. So thank you for including me and uh, Dr. Kelly, great to be with you as well. And thank you everybody else for joining. Thank you, Ty. Dr. Kelly. I see you all. <laughs> I see you. Honored that you shared your time. Thank you, Arlene, for the honor of inviting me to be in your space. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. I mean, it, it really has been fast and furious, our connection. So I'm very appreciative of it. Uh, as uh, Cassandra alluded to, you are a highly sought after individual. So I'm just so grateful that you took the time to join us today. So thank you on that. And thank you for always being a friend of PAVE and your continued support and, um, uh, and, and a sharing of information with us. For those of you who joined us today, thank you so much. We are so excited on um, how this summit is progressing and how it's going. Uh, we hope that you are as well. I will share with you that next Tuesday, our next session will be on 
safety, exploring the intersectional. Up Tuesday's session is personal safety and the US education system, prevention and healing tools that save lives. Our panelists there are representative, representative from UNITAS, which is a human trafficking organization, uh, hoping to eliminate human trafficking, uh, Lamont Hebert, um, we have Maria Del Gilio, which is a, a leader in shaping what Chicago Public Schools' new whole school safety approach is, which is having great success. Uh, and then Steve Hooper, former FBI, former CIA uh, uh, Secret Service, uh, and has takes a completely holistic approach to school safety. Uh, we would love to have you guys participate. Again, thank you so much for supporting the summit. Um, if my panelists could hang on as everyone else exits, um, really appreciative for this conversation. Thank you all.